Hello and welcome to this presentation entitled Top 5 Myths and Truths About Why Committed Mormons Leave the Church. My name is John DeLynn. Um, this is a picture of my family. For those of you who are just listening on audio, uh, this is also a YouTube presentation that you can find at youtube.com slash Mormon Stories. Quick uh, little bit about me. Um, I've spent about the past eight years or so speaking with thousands of disaffected Mormons from all over the world. Uh, I almost left the church myself, to be honest, um, but I recently returned. Uh, I attend church weekly with my family, and I consider myself to be a believer, but I kind of call myself a reconstructed believer um, because I had to sort of lose my faith and then reassemble it again in a way that was comfortable to me. But I still consider myself a believer for whatever that's worth. Um, today we want to talk about um, sort of a very difficult issue within Mormonism, which is um, the extent to which some people are leaving the church. Uh, this graph that I'm showing you here shows a, a quick analysis of um, our attempt to capture uh, the growth rates of Mormonism, but also uh, the activity rates that the church is currently experiencing. And what we find is that even though the church claims somewhere between 14 and 16 million members um, of record, the truth is that uh, the number of active members is, is much less than that. Current estimates are around uh, 5 million or so active members of the church across the world, which is very different from the 14 plus uh, million number that's often quoted. Um, you know, this is something the church has talked publicly, publicly about in articles and elsewhere. Um, and it's a, it's a real issue. Um, maybe, maybe this issue was captured best by Marlon Jensen about a year ago when he basically said, quote, maybe since Kirtland, we've never had a period of, I'll call it apostasy, like we're having now. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a big issue. And the main purpose of this presentation was to discuss, uh, the top five myths that, that many people have, especially believing members of the church have, about why people leave the church. And I'll just kind of list those myths now. Uh, the first myth is that, um, you know, these people who have left were offended by someone. The second is that they desired to sin. The third is that they never had a testimony to begin with. The fourth is that they're lazy, or they stopped praying or reading the scriptures. And the fifth is that they studied anti-Mormon literature. And what I want to do in this presentation today is is challenge those myths and instead lay out some alternative um, uh, answers based on evidence for why people are uh, leaving the church. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I, I myself kind of struggle a little bit with my testimony and uh, and considered leaving the church. But in my experience, uh, I wasn't offended by anyone. I wasn't desiring to commit any sin. Um, I felt like I had a testimony. Uh, I was praying and reading the scriptures regularly. Um, in fact, I was an early morning seminary teacher in Seattle um, in, in uh, the two, early 2000 when I um, started struggling with my testimony. And I certainly wasn't, uh, in my perspective, studying anti-Mormon literature. For me, all of this started while I was studying the CES curriculum manuals for Seminary Institute students when my um, crisis hit. So for me, when I heard these allegations, as I was struggling through my crisis, these allegations felt very hurtful. Um, and, and for me, they made a very difficult situation even more difficult. Um, and so what we're going to be doing today is providing you some data um, so that we're not basing our, our assumptions on on just uh, perceptions or anecdote. So a little bit of background. Um, in 2011, uh, I was approached by a retired member of the third quorum of the 70, um, someone who had served as what many would refer to as a general authority in the church, who was troubled himself by some of the historical issues. Now he was no longer a member of the quorum of the 70. He had um, since retired, but he was troubled by some of these issues. And he wanted to have a meeting with a uh, general authority of the church um, and so he asked me to prepare, me and a few friends to prepare a presentation for this general authority, um, to be able to describe the difficulties and, and maybe try and help the church address these issues. So me, along with several really good friends, we administered a survey online to about 3,000 disaffected Mormons to find out how or why they lost their faith in the church. Um, and, uh, we assembled these data together. We presented them to the general authority. Um, and the general authority valued the information so much that he had this presentation delivered at least once, if not several times, at church headquarters in Salt Lake City 
um, to people at the highest levels, uh, some of the highest levels of the church, including at least one or two apostles, as I understand it. Um, so the, these data have been used by the church um, to help them understand this problem better. And so I just wanted to let you know that our presentation is based on that data. Um, the presentation or the data have been released at a website called whymormonsquestion.org. So if you want to see sort of an in-depth analysis of, of these data, you can do that there. Um, so a little bit about our survey, because um, it's important to know where our sample came from. Again, there were the th over 3,000 respondents to the survey. We call this a sample of convenience or a snowball sample. It was not a random scientific sample. That said, it's a very large sample. Um, most social scientists that I know would, would kill to have a sample of 3,000 people for a study that they're um, uh, conducting. Um, these uh, these participants were recruited through liberal and former Mormon um, LDS websites, forums, blogs, and podcasts, so mostly online recruiting. Um, these participants have a higher than average income and education. They're definitely skewed towards Caucasian, middle to upper class, interconnected, internet connected U.S. church members. So it's definitely not trying to represent the global church or even, you know, a random representation of church members in the U.S. It's definitely, you know, um, from this population that we've drawn from for our sample. Um, one of the one of the graphics that's most stark was a graph graph that sort of represents when people are leaving the church, and what we see from our data is that most of the participants uh, who took our survey, um, almost a thousand of them, uh, left the church within the past three years, three or four years, and and we see that. Um, that there's definitely an exponential trend in growing, uh, a, a trend, growing trend of people leaving the church. And, and that sort of validates the earlier graph that I showed you about decline in active church membership. So let's go ahead and address uh, the five myths and talk about how these data um, help to dispel some of these myths a little bit. The first two myths that we discussed were that people were either offended or they desired to sin. And as we asked them point blank, why did you leave the church? Um, being offended or, you know, wanting to do something like drink alcohol or engage in extramarital sex were actually um, the least common reason cited for them wanting to leave. Now, I realize that this is self-report, but still, um, you know, we, we have to sort of at least take as evidence what these people say were their own experiences. And again, um, four percent indicated having been either offended or a desire to engage in behaviors contrary to church teachings. So again, having been offended or sinning were really not um, accurate when describing why people were leaving the church. Now this will make even more sense when we discuss myths three and four, so we'll jump to them now. Myths three and four are that people leave the church either because they never had a testimony to begin with or because they're lazy and stopped praying and reading the scriptures. However, when we actually um, asked our respondents, uh, you know, what their callings had been in the church up until the point they became disaffected, we were also very amazed. For the men, 73% of the respondents had served missions. This seems very high. 50% had served in elders quorum presidencies, 40% in young men's presidencies. Perhaps what was most stark, one out of five of these male participants had served in bishoprics. So that's 20%. In my experience, that's much higher than you know, in any ward that I've attended where one in five of the male ward um, adults uh, had served in bishoprics. 11% um, had served as temple um, workers. Uh, many were high priest group leaders. We even had 5% of our respondents had served on stake high councils. 4% had served in some type of stake auxiliary presidency. And we had 20 participants who had served in stake presidencies, five who served in mission presidencies, and again, one um, former general authority or area authority from the church. Again, with women, we, we found very similar, very high levels of participation. Over a third had served in Relief Society presidencies. 17% um, had served missions. Uh, many had served in stake auxiliary um, positions, etc. So again, um, I think the best way to reflect this was a comment that a general authority once made to me in tears when he basically said, we in the church are losing our best and our brightest, or some of our best and our brightest. And and that's what our data indicate. So to say that they were weak or weren't reading the scriptures or praying um, or uh, or just really weren't committed or 
or didn't have a testimony to begin with, that doesn't make sense given the fact that so many of them served in such high leadership positions. So if these aren't accurate myths, then what are the most common reasons that people leave? Well, I'll start with a disclaimer um, that some of these issues that we're about to talk about can be very troubling. Um, but I should also say that, that these issues have been reconciled by some people. So it's not like to be exposed to these um, pieces of information means that you're going to lose your faith. It just means that um, you know, you're going to become aware of things that are difficult, um, but that also there are ways to reconcile them if you want to. And we'll talk about some resources at the end um, to help those who want to reconcile some of these difficult issues. So the five types of issues that we've found were the most common reasons why people have left the church are the following. The first are historical issues. The second are scientific issues. The third is doctrinal or theological issues. The fourth is socio-political and cultural issues. And the fifth is spiritual issues. So let's talk about each one. Historical issues, there were many, probably 20 issues that were listed. We're just going to list sort of the most common ones here. The first has to do with Joseph Smith's credibility um, as a prophet and most importantly as a translator. Um, many people learn, and this has been validated in church publications, that before Joseph, uh, you know, sort of actively created the church and, and was serving as a prophet for the church, before that, he sort of had a history of seeking for buried treasure. Um, he would often use a stone um, to try and find the buried treasure. And while there was never any evidence that he really did find any buried treasure, many people believe that he had that gift and talent. And so that, you know, that um, has been explained by some as not a big deal because folk magic was very common um, in, you know, in the early 1800s. Where it becomes difficult for some is that uh, Joseph, it turns out, when he translated the Book of Mormon, um, often used one of the, the seer stones that he had used for treasure digging, where he'd put that in a hat, um, put his face in the hat, and not even really looking at the golden plates, sort of dictate the Book of Mormon through a similar type of means that he had used to allegedly find buried treasure. And this is very troubling for some people. Um, when you when you combine that with the fact that, that um, scientists or linguists or Egyptologists have found um, you know, the early papyra that the Book of Abraham was translated from and have analyzed it, they found really no, um, no relevance or no translation that's in any way accurate between the original Egyptian papyra and what's said or found in the Book of Abraham. And then we also know that, that some people who are trying to fraud, um, fool Joseph Smith brought him some fake plates that, um, that they had created with some, um, with some figures on it and asked him to translate it. Uh, these were called the Kinderhook plates and Joseph actually produced a translation of these plates, which to many indicated that he, uh, you know, wasn't really translating, but he was kind of making things up. So, you know, these are the types of issues that have caused many to, to question Joseph Smith's credibility as a translator. Now, again, there are believers who know all this and have found ways to not have this disrupt their testimony. But these are big issues that have caused many to question their faith. Some of the others are Joseph Smith's polygamy, um, and specifically a, a word many of you may not know called polyandry, which is where Joseph would actually marry um, women who were already married to other men, and in some cases men who were active and faithful in the church. This was confusing. Um, this is confusing to many people, and they don't understand why Joseph would take wives that were already married to other people. Um, and of course, the fact that even after the church denounced polygamy, that they kept practicing it for 10 or 15 years. We call this post-manifesto polygamy. You can look all this up at your leisure, but um, polygamy is a huge problem um, for people in the church once they start learning about it. Um, others are, are bothered by the denial of, of priesthood and temple ordinances to, to blacks. They're also bothered by the racism. Sometimes they find in the Book of Mormon where it equates dark skin um, with evil, evilness and with God's cursings. Um, a lot of people are disturbed by the Masonic influences from the Masonic Lodge and many things that crept into the LDS Temple Ceremony, many of those things which have been re removed, which is also disturbing to some um, because they wonder why the Temple Ceremony is changing so much. Um, many people are bothered by um, the fact that Joseph offered multiple and varying accounts of his first vision story and that the story, in some people's opinion, sort of changed over time. The more he told it, the more it changed. Um, uh, 
Many people have issues with the credibility of the priesthood restoration, specifically that there's no real evidence of when the Melchizedek priesthood was given, and that um, many of the early church leaders for many years never even knew or talked about the Melchizedek priesthood, and that confuses people. And of course, Brigham Young's teachings about uh, blood atonement and Adam God theory have caused many to struggle, and the Mountain Meadows Massacre, where many um, innocent men, women, and children were um, were massacred by members of the church. And then there was sort of a cover-up that happened after that, in many people's opinion. These are the historical issues um, that trouble people uh, most often. I just have one quick slide from our data, which show that polygamy is one of the fastest um, rising issues. In other words, it's becoming more and more of an issue. And this has become, this is because People have known about polygamy for, you know, obviously over a hundred years, but the polyandry, um, and the, and the young ages of some of these brides are things that people are only becoming aware of now. And to be honest, many members of the church that I, I work with were never taught that Joseph Smith actually practiced polygamy. They just kind of thought Brigham Young was the first. And so that, that causes a lot of people trouble. Um, a quote from one of our participants sort of sums up these historical issues. Um, this, this respondent who's a male in his 30s wrote, it's not any one of these historical issues, but the accumulation of them combined with the church's lack of addressing these concerns on their own that's the problem. And that's accurate from what I've read. So those are the historical issues. As far as scientific issues go, um, some of the main ones are, first of all, the age of the earth. Uh, you know, the Doctrine and Covenants says that the earth is 6,000 years old, give or take. Um, that's a problem for people when, when scientists tell us that the earth is billions of years old. Um, when people start thinking about Adam and Eve, um, you know, existing 6,000 years ago, they look at anthropology and history and find that, that man has been on the earth much longer than 6,000 years. And so they don't know how to um, reconcile that. They also don't know how to reconcile this teaching traditionally in the church that there's been no death. There was no death, animal, plant, or um, human before the fall of Adam and Eve, yet geological records show that men, animals, and plants have been living and dying for, again, billions of years. This doesn't quite jive with um, the Adam and Eve story and a literal interpretation of the Bible. Um, Noah's Ark story and the global flood, you know, how did he get all the animals on the boat, two of every kind, for all the different species that we have across the world, and then where did all the water come from that could fill up the whole earth? Um, and, and how could all these species spread across all the continents, in, you know, in the past 6,000 years? This just doesn't make sense to people who understand science. If, again, you take a literal interpretation of Noah's story. Many, many people believe in evolution these days. Um, even biology professors at BYU are strong believers and supporters of evolution. This is a problem to traditional Mormons, especially those who, who believe in the teachings of John McConkie and others. And then Book of Mormon has come under a lot of scientific scrutiny as of late. Um, they've done DNA tests of Native Americans and have found that uh, Native Americans don't have what we would surmise to be sort of um, Middle Eastern or Israeli DNA, but their DNA, the majority of them, the vast majority of them, their DNA ties directly to Asia. Um, and that doesn't make sense for people who sort of equated uh, you know, Lamanites with, with Latin Americans or, or Native Americans just doesn't make sense for many. Now, again, there are explanations for this, but, um, we'll, we'll address those hopefully in, um, in future episodes or we'll refer you to, uh, ap apologetic resources to try and explain. Another big issue that scientists have found with the Book of Mormon are what call, what are called anachronisms. And the two most common examples are horses that are found in the Book of Mormon and steel that's found in the Book of Mormon. Neither of these things existed in the Americas sort of, uh, you know, during the time that, that Lehi and Nephi came over. Um, horses and steel were developed, uh, you know, sort of after the conquistadors. Um, horses arrived when the conquistadors brought them in the 14, 15, 1600s to America. So there weren't any horses during the time that Native Americans were living in the Americas. And as far as steel goes, steel was developed again after, um, you know, much after the time that Nephi or, or Mormon or any of those, um, you know, characters or figures in the Book of Mormon would have been engaging in wars. And people ask, and if there were steel or, or swords, or shields, you know, why haven't we found any? And archaeologists and anthropologists really haven't found helmets or, or shields or swords of, of any type of metal or steel specifically. 
And so it doesn't make sense uh, for many. And then finally, um, some people sort of dismiss the Book of Mormon as a fictional work that they borrowed from the Bible, that they borrowed from um, other sources like a book called The View of the Hebrews um, or or sort of common stories that were being told during the time of Joseph Smith's era um, or even sermons that were given by by local religious leaders. And so they come to view the Book of Mormon more as a fictional work than as a real record of history. And then finally, as I mentioned before, Egyptologists have studied the papyrus that, are, that supposedly the Book of Mormon was based on, and they found it to be what, what's referred to as a common funerary text or funeral sort of uh, writings. And it has, you know, according to these Egypt, Egyptologists, nothing really to do with the text that Joseph Smith produced. So these are some of the scientific issues. As far as doctrinal or theological issues, people leave the church often because they lose their belief in God or, or Christ. Um, many, when they start reading the scriptures, they find the scriptures to be inconsistent or even mean or barbaric. Um, and, and they start to not view the scriptures as credible or divine or even worthwhile. Um, many lose the belief in the idea of a one true church. They kind of think there's billions of people on the earth and only, you know, five million active Mormons. Um, how can this be the one true church when 99.995% of the world's population doesn't even really know about Mormonism? How can that be? How could God be that inefficient? Um, why does it have to be just one true church? Um, many lose belief in the need for exclusive saving ordinances or proxy work for the dead. They feel like that's kind of an inefficient model to get people back to heaven. Why do you need these ordinances to be able to go back and live with your heavenly father or mother? Many lose faith in the Book of Mormon and its narratives about a dark skin being a curse. They just feel like that's a racist idea and that there's no God that they want to leave in that would curse people with dark skin for their wickedness because many believe dark skin is beautiful and good and, uh, and so forth. And many lose faith in their church leaders and in prophetic authority and credibility. They just see many sort of view our church prophets as being behind the times on significant events like the civil rights movement, um, you know, gay rights, women's rights, uh, science, etc. And they basically say these leaders are sort of lagging, not leading us in, in prophetic ways. Um, there are many socio-political and cultural issues that uh, cause people to leave the church. Um, many are concerned with the unequal or unsatisfactory treatment of women and minorities in the church, specifically that women aren't allowed to um, engage in many of the activities that men are and that there's unfair treatment. Um, many are bothered by the church's stance on homosexuals and, you know, the opposition of same-sex marriage, like with Proposition 8. That's become a huge trending issue. Um, some are bothered by the excessive political conservatism, conservatism in the church. Many equate the church with Russ Limbaugh and, and Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity, and they don't feel comfortable expressing more liberal political views, at least in the United States, um, in, in the quorum meetings or in Sunday school, etc., um, many are bothered by the church's lack of financial transparency um, and specifically their decision to build a multi-billion dollar mall. Some feel like that's not what Christ would do with, with the money. If he had it, he would instead give it to the poor. And many are bothered by what they perceive as a culture of control and conformity, of anti-intellectualism, anti-science, and of perfectionism that makes many people feel guilty and sad. Finally, um, oh, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the trending issues that we found in addition to polygamy is the treatment of homosexuality. And this makes sense because as older members of the church who um, are less open and tolerant about um, the LGBT community, as they die off and as the younger generation comes, the younger generation is just more accepting and loving of LGBT, gay, lesbian, transgender um, bisexual individuals. And so this is an issue that will continue to plague the church. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's manifested by the fact that the church has released this new website called mormonsandgays.org where they're trying to show more empathy and love and support for gays and lesbians, which we all see is a very good thing. Finally, the final um, area that caused many people to leave the church are spiritual issues. Um, some people feel like they never received the, the spiritual witness that they were promised in the first place after sincere multiple attempts. This is in the minority because I think most feel like they had a testimony, but there's a few that feel like they never got the witness how hard they tried. Some begin to question or reinterpret their past spiritual experiences and wonder if they were just manipulated emotionally, 
whether they just wanted to believe and so they sort of emotionally convinced themselves or they just sort of say I felt emotional things but that's not necessarily the spirit talking. Um, many leave because they don't feel spiritually edified in their church participation and it's just not edifying to them anymore. Many feel burned out, um, don't feel like they're good enough. Many feel bored or uninspired in their church activities or participation. And some actually report that they feel spiritually inspired to leave the church and go on to other spiritual endeavors. So those are the five main issues. If we had to summarize the issues that seem most highly correlated and most common, it's Joseph Smith, church history, the church's doctrine and theology, and um, the Book of Mormon, issues with the Book of Mormon, that are sort of the four most highly correlated and problematic issues that are causing people to lose the church. Other trending issues include DNA in the Book of Mormon, Book of Abraham, First Vision, the treatment of women, and science. So those are issues to sort of look out for in the future as growing in importance and significance. So this brings us to myth number five, the fact, the claim that these people left the church because they studied anti-Mormon literature and were deceived or brought down because of anti-Mormon literature. And it turns out from the people um, in this survey that, that in reality it wasn't anti-Mormon resources that they were consulting. It's usually primary sources um, that cause people to first doubt and question. So for example, um, the scriptures themselves often are the impetus for someone's doubt and questioning. So for example, they're in Doctrine and Covenants, section 77, verse 6, where it says the earth is 6,000 years old, and they start saying, well, that doesn't make sense. How could the church be 6,000 years old? And that's when they start doubting and questioning. Or they're reading the Book of Mormon, and they read about horses and steel, and they read Gun, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, and they go, oh, wow, how in the world was there horses and steels in, in the Book of Mormon that wasn't brought until later? And that becomes a problem. Or they'll read Doctrine and Covenants section 132. And if you've ever, if you haven't really read it before, you ought to read it. It's very difficult and challenging. And it basically calls polygamy, in some people's interpretation, the new and everlasting covenant. And that becomes very difficult when you hear, for example, Gordon B. Hinckley saying on Larry King Live that polygamy is no longer doctrinal. Um, people get confused by that because it, it appears to be doctrine because it's in Doctrine and Covenants section 132. And this is the type of thing that cause, causes often, most often, people to doubt and question. Other sources that are primary that cause people to doubt and question include, you know, journals of early church leaders are just reading about these journals and, it's, and they start having questions. And then church publications themselves, things like old church newspapers like the Times and Seasons, the journal discourses, you know, speeches that Brigham Young and others gave that are published by the church. The Ensign has many things that cause people to doubt and question. Even going up to FamilySearch.org um, can, can be problematic. And many general authority talks that have been published by the church cause people to doubt and question. So these are all sort of um, primary sources that are very difficult. And this is most often where people begin doubting and questioning, not, um, not quote, anti-Mormon sources. One respondent in our survey, just to sort of summarize this point, said, I never visited anti-Mormon sites, but rather sites maintained by members. With time, I simply could not accept the church's official position on many historical issues. So if these five reasons aren't the reasons why people are disaffected, how does disaffection happen? Well, I've got this little visual that I'm going to show you. Again, go to um, youtube.com slash mormonstories or mormonstories.org to view this presentation in video format. But it's basically a circle that sort of discusses the cycle of disaffection and disaffiliation. And it begins when active members hear about troubling elements of church history, theology, and culture. Sometimes it comes from within them, but sometimes they hear it from other sources. Um, and it can come from many different types of sources. They can just go to Google, um, and Google can be a big problem um, in terms of being the impetus for somebody. They can just be studying, preparing like me for a seminary lesson or a gospel doctrine lesson, and they start Googling Joseph Smith or polygamy or faith, and they can find links on the Internet that they can go to that um, are problematic. But it often, again, starts with their own doubts and questions or traumatic life events. Maybe they're watching South Park and they see the issue or the episode called All About the Mormons where it shows Joseph Smith, you know, translating the Book of Mormon with his face in the hat. And that can be a place. Maybe they watch Larry King and Gordon B. Hinckley where he said polygamy was not doctrinal. That can be a problem. Maybe they read an article in Newsweek about the Mormons and they learn things 
um, about the church that they didn't realize before um, from external sources. Maybe they watched the PBS um, video called The Mormons. That was very disturbing for many as they learned for the first time difficult issues there. Maybe they went to New York and watched the Broadway musical The Book of Mormon, which introduces many issues or doubts or questions there. Maybe they picked up a book like No Man Knows My History, which was written by David O. McKay's niece, and that became um, an issue for them. Or the journal discourses, or as I said, even just studying the scriptures, they stumble on these things. And so they've got these doubts and questions, and they stumble upon this information for the first time. And they don't know what to do with it. They kind of wonder, is this a lie? Is this deceiving? Is this true? Could this be true? What about these doubts that I'm having? And they go and they start searching for information to refute um, what they've learned. And this is where apologetic um, issues within Mormonism really raise their head. If you go to feralds.org or the DLA Maxwell Institute, um, there are these um, long categorical lists of issues um, and responses to difficult issues that people can uh, access. So again, you go to feralds.org, you click on their topical guide, and you see a list of like 200 of the largest issues that face most Mormons. Um, and, and while there are lots of good people at FAIR, FAIR's heart is in the right place, and they do a lot of good work. And I will say that right now up front, FAIR and the Maxwell Institute do a lot of high quality work and they have a lot of very good people doing what they're doing. Um, my my um, understanding of these respondents is that many of our respondents, probably most, find that this information, apologetic information, is often more damaging than helpful. A few of the problems with you know Mormon Apologetics and Fair and the Maxwell Institute. Problem number one is when they go to these sites and they start wondering if these doubts are sort of anti-Mormon lies, the first thing they do is they find out that these problems are actually factual or credible because they're on the list and they're talked about as credible issues. So this, number one, legitimizes many of the problems that these people sort of wondered about. Now this is an unavoidable problem. The second problem is that um, when they stumble onto these sites, they can easily start looking up other problems. So they become introduced to additional problems when they may have only come to these websites with one or two. That again is an unavoidable problem if you're going to try and address all the difficult issues faced uh, within Mormonism. The third problem with these uh, apologetic resources are that many find the answers provided by FAIR and the Maxwell Institute to be unsatisfying. Um, I'm not sure if this is avoidable or not. I believe that there are some satisfying answers to some of the problems, but I believe that there's a lot of bad and faulty um, answers that are also given um, that just really don't aren't effective. They just don't work for the people who are struggling. I don't know if this is avoidable or not. But finally, one of the biggest reported problems with the Mormon apologetic resources is that many find the tone and the tactics used by by LDS apologists to be unchristlike. <clears throat> I definitely believe that this is a is a avoid an avoidable problem, um, and I know that it's something that Fair and the Maxwell Institute are currently working on to try and fix. Um, but you see it very clearly in the quotes by the respondents to our survey. So I'll just read to you a few of their responses. Quote, as I studied church history and uncovered many controversial historical evidence, I would frequent LDS apologetic sites for answers like Farms and the Maxwell Institute and Fair and Shields. I soon discovered these sites rarely dealt with the controversial evidences, but rather often skirted or obfuscated the issues and frequently reported resorted to personal attacks on the individuals who were publishing historical information. So this is this is reported by the people who had these experiences, who have left the church. This is what they experienced going to apologetic uh, websites. Another wrote, it was the apologetic attempts by fair that helped convince me that the church doesn't have a good explanation for its side. Another wrote, I watched farms and fair apologists treat people horribly. For example, one apologist used to lurk on the Recovery for Mormonism website so that he up quotes from the people posting there in order to humiliate them. This coupled with the way apologists tend to treat critics with ad hoc acts was the linchpin. I would encourage him, them, to do something about the apologists. I think they are the worst aspect 
of the current church. Now, it may not be fair um, to, to, to use the term ad hominem attacks. I know the term has been debated. But it is many people's perception that LDS Mormon apologists too often attack the messengers um, and, and blame the victims instead of providing really credit, credible answers in a Christ-like way. Um, others wrote, on, on honesty, please stop leaving it to the apologetics. They are terrible and are doing more damage than good to people's testimonies with their poor answers. For example, the book of Abraham. Another wrote, please stop the ridiculous apologetics. Their circular reasons for fallacies do more harm than good. Finally, one wrote, fair and their answers have done more to destroy their testimonies than any anti-Mormon sources could. For many members, the fact that the LDS Church is officially silent on many of these problems is a testament in and itself that the Church does not have any answer and are hiding behind unofficial apologists like Fair for plausible deniability. And uh, once the members go to these apologetic websites, they find out that all this doubt and information and trouble that they were having is actually accurate. And that is a huge shock. And they sometimes ask themselves, why am I learning this stuff for the first time at age 30 or 35 or 45 or 50? I should have learned this stuff in seminary or an institute or in Sunday school, but I didn't. And so that leaves them feeling like they're betrayed, feeling like the church hid the truth from them. One really important quote from our respondents was, Quote, I defended the church to associates who brought up some historical issues. When I did my own research, I found that they were true. My issue wasn't that they were true, but that my whole life I was never told about them. I felt betrayed by the church. Another wrote, I feel like I cannot trust the general on any spiritual issues because they cannot even be honest and open about our past. And so these active members in this cycle um, feel troubled. But the biggest problem often isn't the issue. It's the fact that they feel betrayed. They feel like the church has lied to them. It's misled them. Um, and they start wondering if they can trust the church again. And so they go to family members and friends and they share their concerns. And because people's faith is precious to them, because these issues can be perceived as attacking or disrespectful, the active members of the church um, can often treat their family and friends who are doubting or questioning very harshly. It can make them feel sad or guilty or shamed for even learning or questioning or doubting or asking these um, questions. And so oftentimes the, the non-questioning, believing church members, the family and friends start distancing themselves emotionally and physically from the active member who's questioning. And that becomes uh, even more problematic and exacerbates the problem. Um, one, one of our respondents wrote, the church needs to be honest with its history and contradictions. Instead, they make us, who have discovered the complicating facts, look like the evil ones. I am shunned by my family. They think I am a liar and a deceiver when it is the church and general authorities who have deceived us. Um, so this is a major factor that, you know, some of you may be... Uh, uh, bothered when ex-Mormons refer to the church as a cult. But this is a major factor that leads ex-Mormons to call the church a cult. It's a natural reaction for members to feel scared and angry and to want to distance themselves. Not Christ-like. And it doesn't feel open and loving. And so um, it, it becomes a real problem when people are treated meanly or unkindly by church members, by family, by friends, simply for asking difficult questions and trying to find answers. And so they feel even more betrayed um, over these issues, which are magnified by anger at the loss of familial relationships. And so things sort of just spiraling and getting worse. Um, and so by the time that they have had these problems, uh, found out that they were legitimate, um, had them validated, found that the apologetic uh, websites didn't provide satisfactory answers, wondered why the church lied to them or kept these things from them or didn't speak openly about them, and then they tried to talk to family and friends who were believers and were ostracized, they become disaffected. They, um, they become often angry and frustrated and sad. And then they start sharing their pain and anger with other people. And then, you know, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, and then the cycle can can repeat. 
So, um, you know, one respondent wrote, stop hurting marriages by driving a wedge between spouses on this issue. I've gone through hell and back and nearly divorced. We desperately need a general conference address telling spouses to not divorce an otherwise good spouse over non-belief. I have several friends who have been divorced over primarily this issue, and my own marriage is still on the rocks due to it, even though I am fully active. And for me, this is one of the most heartbreaking aspects of this whole dilemma, is that in many cases, really good marriages and really good families become torn apart, even leading to divorce, um, because one of the members uh, of the couple can't believe or doesn't believe or struggles, the other doesn't understand, and it leads to a divorce. And I believe that that's tragic. One other respondent wrote, tell your bishops and leaders to tell their members to not divorce their spouse when they leave the LDS church. My hub husband was advised by his bishop to divorce me. We had 10 children. It was awful. The church that says families are the most important, you should be ashamed of yourselves. So, this has been a really quick overview of many of the difficulties that cause people to question and leave the church. But let's get to the most important part. How can we, um, who are active members of the church, who are believing members of the church, how can we help those who are struggling? Well, I'm going to start by using the example of what's not helpful. And not to pick on Brigham Young because he um, did many amazing things and good things, but he gave a quote in the Journal of Discourses on what he called apostates. And he said, quote, If there is a despicable character on the face of the earth, it is an apostate from this church. He is a traitor who has deceived his best friends, betrayed his trust, and forfeited every principle of honor that God placed within him. They are disgraced in their own eyes. There is not much honesty within them. They have forfeited their heaven, sold their birthright, and betrayed their friends. This is not helpful. This type of response is not helpful. Um, to show empathy with those who are believers who fear and disparage those who question and doubt, it's very easy to see these people who are doubting or have left the church as dark or as sinful, as having lost the spirit, as lost um, in their lives. It's easy to see them as dishonest or as breaking their covenants. It's easy to see them as threatening and dangerous or as deceived by Satan. I totally understand why you would feel that way. I used to feel that way when people who had left the church came to me. Um, but that is often a matter of perspective. And in many cases, maybe most cases, it's flat out wrong. Instead, um, these people most often see themselves as seeking the truth at any cost. If you think about some of the primary songs that we've been taught, do what is right, let the consequence follow. Oh, say what is truth, tis the fairest gem. In many cases, these people are following their integrity and their honesty and their seeking truth, which is very much a Mormon value. Uh, and these people see themselves as acting bravely and with integrity because they sacrifice a great deal, including their own um, values, uh, you know, that they have their own identity, their own security. There's a lot at stake for coming clean and openly discussing these issues. And it takes someone who's very brave and courageous to do it. Um, and so they see that they see themselves as acting with integrity. They see themselves as being more honest than they've probably ever been in their lives with their loved ones, with you, with everyone. <clears throat> and they see themselves as following the light as they seek truth, not as following darkness. And many of them, frankly, um, consider themselves to be very happy now, not dark and sad. Um, I would say even most consider themselves to be happier where they end up than where they were before. Now that's their perspective, but it should be honored just like yours should be honored. And so these things seem like very Mormon values that we should respect. And so what should we not do in reaction to these people who are, child, who are loved ones who are struggling? We shouldn't assume anything, okay? We shouldn't fall prey to any of these stereotypes or myths that they just want to sin, that they've been offended, that they're lazy, that they never had a testimony, that they've been spending too much time on anti-Mormon literature. I hope I did a decent case of showing you that in many cases those are, are myths that are not true. We shouldn't put to them or lecture them or give them guilt trips. Why? Psychologically, it creates resistance. You preach at them and lecture them and 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 seek to... Um, scold them versus understand them. You just push them in the other direction. It just doesn't work. It's ineffective and it's insulting and hurtful. Um, 
you should resist the tendency to reduce the issues to simply praying and reading the scriptures and say, hey, just start praying and reading the scriptures again. It'll make it better. That's one of the problems. Oftentimes this comes from reading the scriptures and the more they read the scriptures, the more angry and frustrated and confused they feel. And, and when they pray and try and get answers, oftentimes the, the answers don't come. And so telling them to pray and read the scriptures just isn't helpful for many of these people and really oversimplifies the difficulty of the issues that they're facing. Um, definitely don't refer them to bad apologetic sources. Now, I'm not saying that all LDS apologetic sources are bad, but if you just say go to FAIR and go to the Maxwell Institute and that will solve problems, in many cases it just causes more problems and just alienates them further. You should spend your time uh, dealing with these issues and learning about them before you just push them off on other sources. Don't judge or fear them. They're still good people. They're still loving, honest people, kind people. They're still the people you've always loved. They're just going through a change in, in beliefs and in perspective and how they see the world. But they deserve not to be judged or feared. And whatever you do, do not avoid and ostracize them. To try and stay away from them, to keep them away from you and your family, to distance yourself from them, to shame them, to fear them. That is the most awful and most unchristlike thing you could possibly do um, in this situation. I'm going to read from the Book of Mormon. Um, in the Book of Mormon, chapter 7, verse 45 through 47, because Mormon gives us a fabulous template for how we should respond with charity to people who are struggling in their faith. And it says, quote, And charity suffereth long, and is kind, and envieth not, and is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, and rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, if ye have not charity, ye are nothing. For charity never faileth. Wherefore, cleave unto charity, which is the greatest of all. For all things must fail, but charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever, and whoso is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with him. And so if we sort of extrapolate this beautiful three-verse set from, from Mormon in the Book of Mormon, how can we help those who have left the church? Number one, be kind to them for a long time. That's what long-suffering means, even when it's uncomfortable and difficult. Listen to them. Always to be kind. Love them unconditionally, not love them and be kind to them if they do what you think you should do, if they follow what you think is right. Love them no matter what they decide about the church and no matter what they believe. Eliminate your agendas for them. They're not objects. They are their own souls with free agency who need to follow their own path. So don't have your desires for what they need to do as what motivates you. And definitely don't try and reconvert them or call them to repentance. That almost always backfires and makes things worse and shows that you don't love them unconditionally. Do the work yourself, number four, to understand where they are coming from. As it says, you know, we believe in the church that we seeketh all good things, that we believe in truth wherever it comes from. So do the find out what's true about their concerns. It turns out that 99% of their issues are factual, have factual problems. And so you should do the work to understand them because you can't love them and have empathy with them until you understand their concerns. Respect and honor their choices, number five. Let them decide what to do with their life and not just tolerate, but respect and honor the decisions that they make. And work with church leaders, number six, Actively go to your bishop, go to your elders quorum president, relief society president, go to your stake president and, and work with them to help them become more informed and empathetic. Give presentations in elders quorum and Sunday school about these issues. Share these resources with others. Um, so that we as a church membership can become more informed about the difficult issues and about how not to deal with these people and how we can more effectively deal with them. And remember most of all, that without charity, quote, ye are nothing, unquote. That can't be emphasized enough. If I had to summarize everything that I've just said, if there's only one slide that you see or remember from this entire presentation, it's this. Love them, 
love them, love them. So let's talk quickly about some resources as we conclude that you can use to become more informed. Unfortunately, there are no official church books or websites at this time that address these issues. Um, it's awesome that the church created the mormonsandgays.org website. Someday, I hope the church creates the equivalent to mormonsandapostates.org or mormonsandexmormons.org or mormons and you know um, the disaffected.org where it will address specifically these difficult issues, provide credible answers, clear things up, and help you know how to deal with these people. Hopefully that will come someday soon. Until it does, these are some resources that I recommend. There are several books that are written by faithful members, you know, former patriarchs, former state presidents, former bishops, current bishops, active members of the church that outline the most difficult issues. A few include Joseph Smith Roughstone Rolling by Patriarch and State President Richard Bushman, By the Hand of Mormon by Bishop Terrell Givens, The Mormon People by Matthew Bowman. All of these books discuss the difficult issues in credible ways. There are also books written by skeptics um, that are critical of the church, but they're very um, credible and factual. They're not perfect, but um, they do a good job of of relaying the information in ways to help understand the mindset of the disaffected. These books would include An Insider's View of Mormon Origins by Grant Palmer, No Man Knows My History, The Life of Joseph Smith by Fawn Brody, and Losing a Lost Tribe by Simon Southerton, which talks about Native Americans, DNA, and the Mormon Church. There are also other several um, classic books that just everyone should read if they want to become a student of Mormonism. David O. McKay and the Rise of Modern Mormonism by Greg Prince, um, the Angel and the Beehive by Armin Moss, and Adventures of a Church Historian by Leonard Arrington. Those are books that I think every Mormon who um, wants to understand these issues should read. Um, FairLDS.org and, and the Maxwell Institute both provide a lot of really good information in spite of the difficult things I said. I know that they're working to improve the information that they provide and to change their tactics somewhat, so I'm going to recommend them um, as great resources. Another website that, that is also excellent is mormonthink.com. It's definitely managed and run by skeptics or critics or, you know, non-believers in the church, but they work really hard to outline both. They, they, they work really hard to prevent, to present only factual information from primary sources. They may um, lay out the difficulties and the information and the arguments that the critics um, offer, but they also work really hard to also represent the apologetic, um, um, uh, positions as well. And uh, again, it's a critical site that is sort of a, a non-believing, um, but it's it's a valuable resource of information. One of the most comprehensive on the internet that I've uh, been able to find. StayLDS.com is a website that, that I helped create with Brian Johnston and others. It's an excellent resource. It has both um, articles to help you stay in the church after you've had a crisis of faith. There's an article on there called How to Stay in the Church After a Crisis of Faith, which has helped um, tens of thousands of people stay in the church. There's a forum on there where you can go and ask questions to people who are still in the church if you're trying to figure out a way to stay. Can't recommend uh, that enough. There are several podcasts out there that discuss these difficult issues that try and do it um, from both a faithful and a critical perspective. Um, my podcast, Mormon Stories, um, has been viewed by lots of people and um, is a popular site for learning about these difficult issues from both a faithful and a critical perspective. Another podcast called Mormon Expression does quality work. Um, it is a it is a more critical um, uh, podcast uh, that um, you know many would see as antagonistic towards the church, um, but it still uh, does a lot of good work, and I think it's worth uh, getting to know. Um, a couple other podcasts that I sponsor through the Open Stories Foundation includes Mormon Matters, run by Dan Witherspoon that basically tries to discuss difficult issues within Mormonism in a faithful way. It's one of the best resources in the world about faithful Mormonism. And a new podcast that we've released called A Thoughtful Faith um, uh, interviews uh, believing Mormons about uh, modeling a more advanced and sophisticated faith that's informed by information but's also faithful. So if you want role models of people who know all the difficult issues but still believe, go to Mormon Matters, go to A Thoughtful Faith, go to Mormon Stories and you'll find them there. Another excellent new resource we have is called Mormon Stories Sunday School. 
um, or Engaging Gospel Doctrine. It's a podcast run by Jared Anderson, and it attempts to model a more thoughtful, sophisticated approach to studying the scriptures, studying church doctrine and theology, while being fully knowledgeable and aware of the many difficult issues. It's an excellent resource. I highly recommend it. There are also several blogs out there. Um, BuyCommonConsent.com is an excellent, thoughtful, faithful blog that I recommend, as is FeministMormonHousewives.org, which uh, deals with uh, women's issues and, and feminist issues, but also from a faithful perspective. So to conclude, ask yourself, you know, you may be asking yourself, what should I do now? Um, I've got a loved one, a husband, a wife, a child, um, you know, a family member, a friend that's no longer believing or is leaving the church or they've left the church. What should I do? Here's what I recommend to you. Number one, call your loved one and set up a time to talk or a regular time to talk and then meet with them and listen. Listen, listen, listen and love them. Love them and listen sincerely and genuinely with an open mind and an open to understand where they're coming from. Once you've done that, start studying. Become more informed about the difficult issues. Please do yourself a favor. Make your faith deeper and richer and learn all these difficult issues so that they can never bother or trouble you and so that you can understand where your loved one is coming from. Please share this, if you like this audio-visual presentation or this audio presentation, this PowerPoint presentation, please share it with other family members, friends, ward members, and church leaders. You can give them the PowerPoint, you can point them to the YouTube presentation or the podcast audio, or just sit down and talk with them about it. Whatever you have to do, please get the word out that these are difficult issues, that we're handling it wrong, and there are better ways to handle these issues. And remember, most of all, have faith in your Heavenly Father and Mother that all things are going to work out in the end. That you don't have to operate from a place of fear or anger or hatred or, or suspicion. You can operate from a place of faith and hope and love, knowing that this is all part of God's eternal plan. And that somehow, someday, this is all going to work out. That people may come back to the church later or in the afterlife, somehow it's going to be worked out. But just trust in your in your heavenly parents that things are going to be okay. Don't operate from a place of fear. Remember that if you have charity, ye are nothing if you have not charity. And so most of all, operate from a charitable perspective. Um, thank you so much for listening to this presentation today. Again, you can check it out at mormonstories.org or whymormonsquestion.org. Um, or youtube.com slash Mormon Stories. You can learn more about um, all these informations, download the PowerPoint, print it out, share it with others. And please feel free to email us at mormonstories at gmail.com if you um, have any questions or need any help. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, I appreciate your time and hope you share this with others. Take care.